Welcome back to the Advent Calendar House, the official holiday podcast for people who hate all humans, which in 2020 is most of us. But today we are dancing to the beat of our own drum back to 1968 and back into the Rankin Bass universe for the story of the little drummer boy. I am cross-eyed juggling stereotype Mike Westfall. And joining me is the king of desert showman himself, Brandon Medley. Hello, Brandon. I have no gift to bring except myself on this podcast. (laughs) And what a (laughs) gift it is. And I forget which wise man he is because they all sound the same to me. It's Michael May. Hey, Michael. Hey, I usually try to be pretty upbeat for podcasts, but for this special episode, I'm going to have my angry eyebrows on and be scowling the entire time. (laughs) (laughs) So, the little drummer boy. I've got to admit, I didn't watch this one until I was adult. What about you guys? Uh, no, it was, a, it was, um, I mean, it was aired regularly. I'm not saying like we didn't make appointment television for it like we did with Charlie Brown or, um, you know, what other, what, what other things, Rudolph. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if it was on and we were available, we would watch it. It was, you know. We, we would watch whatever ABC or CBS or Hoover decided to throw at us. Last night might have been my first time watching this. Wow. Really? Yes. Wow. Um, I've made mention when I've been on the episodes of the show before that a lot of the l- lower tier Rankin Bass specials, I didn't see until um, when I was in college in the early 2000s um, and had cable TV for the first time and abc family or right. i think it was still fox family at the time might have been um like i think it made the swap sometime when i was in college but okay. they would do like on one saturday morning during their 25 days of christmas they would do like starting from like 6 a.m to 10 a.m or something kind of all of these more obscure rank and bass specials and so i saw a lot of them for the first time and then if i ever saw this before that's when it was but I really don't remember it. Um, I, I It's one that, especially once all these things started coming out on DVD, I definitely saw, like, I, I, I recognized it. You know, I knew what the right. character looked like and stuff. Um, but I was really, I mean, I could kind of predict the story because it's based on the song and it follows some familiar tropes of Rankin Bass specials. But um the details, you know, this was all pretty new to me. Like I said, I may have seen it once before about 15, 20 years ago, but not a regular. Yeah, this is a weird one because it's not a top tier special, but it's not a bottom tier special either. I feel like it's very well known. It might be the the highest bottom or middle tier special in the Rankin Bass catalog. Yeah. As for me, I knew it existed as a kid. Uh, And for a lot of people, Little Drummer Boy is on the Mount Rushmore of Rankin Bass Christmas classics with Rudolph, Frosty, and Santa Claus is coming to town. But I never caught it on TV somehow, and I guess neither had my parents' VCR because it never made it onto one of my tape collections. Hmm. So I didn't watch this till maybe 2003 or 2004, whenever the original television Christmas classics collection came out on DVD. Has the other three on the cover, but surprise, they shoved this on a disc with Santa. (laughs) But I can't really deny its place as a classic. It's from 1968, debuting December 19th on NBC, which makes this only the second stop motion Rankin Bass Christmas special ever made. The first after Rudolph and the third overall a year after Cricket on the Hearth. It was written by Romeo Muller, who apparently named it as his favorite out of everything he worked on with Rankin Bass. That surprised wow. me a bit. Yeah, yeah. that kind of lowers him a couple of notches in my uh, <laughs> estimation. <laughs> like, that's a choice. I was really surprised to hear how old it was. Like just looking at it and based on my knowledge of other Rankin Bass specials, I expected this one to be a late 70s one, you know, kind of those rounding out the classic era where, okay. you know, like some yeah. of the other ones we've talked about are. So to hear that this one, and I really, I had not put it together that it was only the third one and the second Christmas one at that, um, or however you just described it. Right. But it's, yeah. Um, 
it seems like it would be. Uh, yeah, I would definitely say it's like a good mid, mid, mid middle shelf. There you go. Rankin Bass. And it's the first one that they cut to a half hour. It's a 25 minute special. Doesn't seem too long or too short to me. It's exactly the right size for a TV special you're trying to build from a two minute song. Exactly. I had in my notes that I really appreciated that this was in and out in less than a half hour. <laughs> yep. And it's probably the most efficient Rankin Bass storytelling. Ooh, okay. I would say. Like, it's in and out. There's a little bit of that soggy middle, but there's there's none of this, like, long, drawn-out songs that aren't catchy <laughs> and sad and mournful or anything. It's it's in and out. It tells its story. It knows what it's about. Gets out of there. <laughs> yeah, there's no, like, uh, side characters who suddenly, like, go off on their own quest that we have to follow around for half an hour to only have them circle back at the <laughs> end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they do keep it tight. Uh, well, let's get into it, starting with our narrator, or rather our storyteller, as she's introduced and credited, Miss Greer Garson, which she was married, but whatever. Call people what they want to be called. Greer Garson, Mrs. Miniver, if you've seen that. And it came to pass that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, and all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. For to disobey the Roman emperor meant certain death. Does either of you have a specific Greer Garson touch point besides this? I was trying to think of it. Like, her name obviously is, you know, quite well known, but uh, I'm not coming up with anything. Yeah, I saw her name and I, was, I did not recognize her name. Um, I looked her up and I looked through her filmography and I had, I've seen a number of movies that she's in, um, you know, the lots of classic movies, but I could not say that I remembered. Oh yeah. Her, you know, okay. she's like, well, I know I've seen that, but I don't know who she is. I'm glad it's not just me then. Cause, cause I know her because her name's in the credits here. Uh, the only other thing that comes close is Disney's the happiest millionaire, which was a year before this, but. Greer Garson was one of only two people to receive Oscar nominations for acting five years in a row. The other is Betty Davis. So that's a tiny, tiny exclusive group. Oh, wow. Uh, so she sets up the story of the little drummer boy by setting up that other bigger Christmas story. Tax season. <laughs> we open with Luke, too, but she goes off on her own little tangent from that Pretty quickly with the whole, for to disobey the Roman emperor meant certain death. And I thought, ooh, is is that going to come up again? Nah. <laughs> so we're looking at a long line of people crossing the desert. Oh, there were young people and old people, the famous and mighty, and a close-up of Mary and Joseph, as she explains, and some not yet known, but whose names would eventually linger and be revered for all time. And you'd think they uh, that she would kind of linger on that a little more, but that was just more setup, I guess. Uh, but moving on, she goes about tall people, short people, good people, and there were others. And we meet the crooked entertainer Ben Haramed. Drummer boy, you may not believe me, but this is the luckiest day of your life. Voiced by Jose Ferrer. It's Jose Ferrer, but nice try, you big dummy who was the first Latino to win an Oscar. Yes, and that <laughs> was for his role as Cyrano de Bergerac. Which he also won a Tony for. Oh, did he? Yeah. Oh, wow. And Ben Haramet is accompanied by his bumbling assistant, Ali, who's noticeably cross-eyed and has the weirdest strut as he comes in. Yeah, these characters reminded me a lot when I first saw them of um, Honest John and Gideon from Pinocchio. Oh, mm. wow. I didn't make that connection, but now that you did, you're absolutely right. Yeah, that's a good one. Wow. Especially this one, Ali. I feel like Gideon had that same expression on his face. Yeah. Ali, his head's an almost perfect sphere on the top of a very skinny neck. He looks like a stick figure trying to work out how to walk in three dimensions. <laughs> and they're even trying to get i mean they're running the show themselves they cut out the stromboli but you know and pinocchio they're trying to get him to the show they are yeah 
Uh, but more importantly, Ali is one of at least eight characters in this special, voiced by this podcast's favorite disembodied tour guide, <laughs> Paul Freeze. Paul Freeze. Absolutely. Are, are those animals dancing, Ben Harriman? They certainly are. He is clearly the MVP of this special, and uh, we'll rattle them out as we get it. I think that's a new record as far as specials I've covered are concerned. He also voices all three kings later, uh, mm-hmm. the drummer boy's father for a few lines, and according to Wikipedia, he voiced the three main animals we're about to meet, and almost definitely some background noises. Yeah. Well, it's not Christmas without Paul Freeze. Oh, no, absolutely not. <laughs> right. <laughs> But yeah, that's eight named characters, plus however many more in the background. And if you've been listening in order, I just completed a man of a thousand voices hat trick. So I just talked about Rich Little and the Christmas Raccoons a couple of episodes ago. And the one before this, I talked about Mel Blank in Jack Benny's Christmas shopping show. Add Paul Freeze to that. All three were known as the man of a thousand voices. Hmm. So bingo. So Ali and Bed Haramed are watching interestedly at the titular little drummer boy marching through the desert with three animal companions, a sheep, a donkey, and a camel, all of which are also marching through the desert on their hind legs to the beat of the boy's drum. Faster, old friends, faster! You, Samson, smile! Most impressively, the camel. <laughs> Yeah, and he's like, uh, this is like, it, this thing is weird right away, right? Because he's, he's a misanthrope. But if I remember right, like they, they state that pretty quickly. Like he just, he doesn't like people. Oh, yeah. That he um, hates it, humanity. Right, right. <laughs> and, you know, he's got the, you know, he just looks ticked off all the time. Uh, but yeah, he's shouting at his animals to smile, be peppy, dance. People want to see it. And like, <laughs> You know, I don't I don't get that. Like, you know, he's clearly not doing it himself. He'll claim later that he can't do it or won't do it. Um, so it's just a weird way for him to be introduced. And, and he just looks ticked off as he's telling them to smile, smile. It really is. I don't know where he was going, but. So the drummer boy is named Aaron and his voice is former child actor Teddy Eccles, the voice of Dorno, the kid from the Herculoids. <laughs> Uh, And he also starred in the movie My Side of the Mountain, but he might be best known for this special. Unless you're a huge Herculoids fan. Which I am, but I I wouldn't have. Yeah, but I wouldn't have been able to tell you who was uh, who was that voice. I um, I I don't think he's really good in this. Like he sounds like he's reading. He's he's pretty lousy. in it. I think actually. Um, So I I wanted to check out some other stuff of his. Like, is the kid just a bad actor or just like was this like really just kind of slapdash and they didn't really care. Um, So I checked out one other thing he did, which was Shirley Temple had a a, her own TV show for a while where they told fairy tales. Okay, And they did a version of Winnie the Pooh where um, Ted Eccles played Christopher Robin. And uh, he was only six years old at the time. And you could tell they, they hired him because he was cute because he was also not <laughs> super good in that. Um, <laughs> just very wooden and just kind of I think he could clearly like memorize lines, which is pretty good for a six year old. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, maybe he got better as he got older, but he was 13 when this came out and he wasn't that good. Well, and Rankin Bass doesn't have a very good track record of directing child voice actors and having them emote. Yeah, his performance isn't very good, but it's about what you expect for Rinkin' Best Kids. I yeah. was just surprised when I saw it was an actual actor, not just one of the animator's kids. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they would go to that are. well later and often. <laughs> uh, so Aaron has three dancing animal companions, a donkey named Samson, a camel named Joshua, and a little lamb named Baba. Not Baba, but that's the joke, I assume. Didn't they call him at the very beginning uh, Ben Baba? Oh, uh-huh, I didn't. Ben. I didn't hear that. And you, Ben Baba, be lighter, happier. <laughs> but I just—they definitely because... call him just Baba the rest of the time. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't even put it together that it was ba- like Baba. No, me too. It took Mike explaining <laughs> that. <laughs> That's a subtle one, like that—the talking snowball named Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Ben Haram had the self-proclaimed king of the desert showman. 
a traveling caravan of performers, and he wants Aaron to be part of his show. But Ali informs us he won't join willingly because Aaron hates humans, as we've established. He would have done very well in quarantine. Oh, yeah, he really <laughs> would have. Um... Well, Ben's aware of that, so he abducts him. And that's how we go into our opening credits with a child kidnapping. <laughs> And then we have, like, hey, kids, it's the Vienna Boys Choir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I hear the song The Little Drummer Boy alongside other carols like Silent Night and Joy to the World. And I thought, this song's also at least a couple hundred years old, right? No, it was written in 1941 by Catherine Davis as Carol of the Drum. It's not even a hundred years old. Wow. Originally recorded in 1951 by the Trap Family Singers. Like the actual Trap Family Singers? Yes. Okay, it's like, like from Sound of Music, Trap Family Singers. The Trap Family Singers, not not the kids from the movie. or Right, right, but the, the, the actual family that that was based on. Yes. Wow, cool. Uh, the arrangement we typically hear today was co-written by... Harry Simeone and Henry Onorati and first recorded in 1958. So there's that on the other side of the opening credits. Ben Harmet explains his plan to perform in front of the crowds in Jerusalem, who will apparently be craving entertainment as they wait to pay their taxes. And I'm just imagining me waiting in line at the DMV, watching someone juggle. That's not <laughs> making me feel any better. Y'all. <laughs> But Aaron explains he hates people, all people. Ben argues it's better to be crowded and rich than crowded and poor. And here's our first of three original songs in this special, When the Goose is Hanging High. When the day is good and the wind is dry and the goose is hanging high. I can't work like other men do when the goose is hanging high. I actually looked up to see if there were even ge- geese in ancient Israel. <laughs> <laughs> were there? Because <laughs> I was like, this definitely. There were. Not the type of geese would think. And this fra- this phrase is definitely um, anachronistic. But, um, <laughs> but there are a couple of types of geese that are, were native. Yeah, I, I generally like this song. It's, it, well, outside of the Vienna Boys Choir singing the actual theme song, <laughs> right. this is probably my favorite. Like... Um, I think it's a little bit short for me. Um, and, and what I mean by that is like, it kind of tries to slow down and be dramatic at the end and they kind of build back up. And, and I don't think it fully, um, lands like it's supposed to, yeah. but, uh, but it is a good, right, right. <laughs> but it is a cool, like it's, it's a catchy little tune. These are better than a lot of the, um, original Rankin Bass songs of later specials. Yeah, I would say that, but as I'm listening to this, all I can hear in my head is this song reminds me of If I Were a Rich Man. Totally. <laughs> Half Fiddler in the Roof, written in my notes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what it's trying to be. It's trying oh, to be absolutely. like a big showstopper like that. Yeah. Like even the themes are sing- similar. And Ben even sings, mm-hmm. I want to live like a rich man lives at one point. Right, right. And that, I guess, is enough to shut up Aaron and convince him to go into the city and perform because, as we're reminded, he hates all humans. (laughs) But why? Glad you asked. It's time to go back. (laughs) Flashback. (laughs) To when Aaron was the happy son of a shepherd and his wife, who all lived on a farm, were flashing back to Aaron's parents, giving him his drum for his birthday. And we said Aaron's dad is Paul Fries. His mother is June Foray for a line or two. So, I mean, if anybody could become the woman of a thousand voices. Yes. It would be June Foray. Absolutely. (laughs) I think it was Mel Blanc who said uh, June Foray is not the female Mel Blanc. I'm the male June Foray. Yeah, I've heard that before. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've mentioned her in a while since back talking about Cindy Lou Who. So it's been a bit. <laughs> but this drum, Miss Greer Garson tells us, has an almost magical quality that attracts animals to dance to it. And that's how they tie that in. Yeah, I thought it was weird. The, 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 oh, it's not just any drum. It's a magical drum. 
and the like because it's a gift of love and it, it almost made me wonder like is, is this where jk rowling got that whole thing from for harry potter and the gift of love from his mom sacrificing herself it just reminded me of that for some reason hmm. um it kind of it, i don't know this this is one of those parts uh, that made me roll my eyes a little bit yeah i've seen this special probably 50 billion times and i have forgotten i guess i just gloss over that it's a magical drum like every time like i, I you're revealing that to me is like just I I I totally forgotten that even though I've seen this special a bunch. Well, you gloss over it because the special glosses over it. They say <laughs> it's a magic drum, and then they never come back to that point. It's yeah. like they they felt like they had to explain why the oxen lamb keeps time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, is that what it's supposed to be for that, I, that one? Po- you know oh how, my goodness! I just feel like. It, That's it. it feels like that kind of writing where like you have in like a prequel or something where it's like, we got to explain every little thing. Yeah. So now I wish it was an hour long and that we had like this backstory about where this magic drum came from. <laughs> the origin of the magic drum. But it's just love. So, yeah. I mean, most gifts are given in love. So <laughs> everything could be magical <laughs> if that's yes. all it takes. This Amazon gift card will make <laughs> wear like a talisman around my neck. Yeah. <laughs> like Dogs a very dancing. large scapular. <laughs> <laughs> Look it up, kids. Um <laughs> And all's well until bands of the desert come in the night, steal the livestock, burn the farm, and kill Aaron's parents. We actually see one guy throw a sword and Aaron's father fall to the ground. One thing I've learned about Rankin Bass, they're not afraid to get dark when they have to. They killed Frosty twice. (laughs) True. And the rest of his family. Mm Mm-hmm. This is basically Conan's origin story from Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> I wanted his dad to ask, like, ask him about the riddle of the steel. Oh, <laughs> You're not wrong. I didn't put that together. <laughs> yeah, Aaron's mother's telling them run before she's also either stabbed or burned to death, I assumed. And so now this orphaned kid wandering alone in the desert with three animals hates all humans because of this. So we're back in the present. In the very crowded city of Jerusalem, where Ben meets up with the rest of his show caravan, just two guys. That's it. That's the caravan. Let <laughs> me talk about how um, Ben is a very, very anti-Semitic caricature. Yeah. He's got the big nose, the bushy, dark eyebrows. There's a scene even somewhere along this point in the special where he's like playing in the gold coins while he laughs. Oh, yeah. And the whole song where he's trying to be trying to do Fiddler on the Roof. It's it's yeah, that too. <laughs> it's bad, but it it's not the worst I've seen from them. What was it? Nestor yeah. with that? Oh, that was that yeah. one's probably the worst. <laughs> yeah, we talked about that one, too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Nestor. Uh, yeah, I mean, Ben Haramed is a problematic, you know, presentation, but it, it but it's weird. Like Jose Ferreira is like the best like he's he's like the most fun most lively character he is in the show like uh yeah he he keeps it going for me he is moving the story along yep but that's his caravan two guys sitting in a corner roll out a carpet to act as the stage for the show <laughs> ben jumps on one of the the guy jumps on one of one of his caravan members to get the crowd's attention with a very awful blow of his horn but no matter our first act is a pair of tumblers extraordinary direct from the palace of the emperor of China. No, they're not. Uh, even though one of them is clearly a white dude who trips on the carpet and neither of them is a particularly great performer. The same is true for Ali, Ben's cross-eyed sidekick introduced to the crowd as the greatest juggler under the stars. But Ali also trips over the same carpet <laughs> that doesn't even impact his juggling act. He's just throwing pots in the air, not catching them, and making a face as each one falls to the ground and breaks. Yeah, and Ben Haradad seems surprised by all this too. By the way, He's- <laughs> right? It's not supposed to be some like they're not clowns. They're trying yeah. to be serious performers. Here's your waiting in line for tax day, 
entertainment. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, has he never seen these guys perform before? Like, are they always this bad? Or are they just having an off day? I don't know. They're all clearly just awful. So he's down to Aaron. Right. Yeah. Who refuses to smile for the crowd. So mm-hmm. Ben paints a happy face on him. Yeah. <laughs> you want to know how I got these scars? <laughs> That's all I can think of. Right. <laughs> Well, Aaron gets his drum and starts singing. Doesn't seem to be bothered at all that there's a fake smile painted on his face. It sure beats a real one, but I guess he's thinking. But he plays and the animals dance and he sings, Why can't the animal smile? You never heard a lion laugh. You never saw a gator grin. A goose in a gaggle never gives a giggle. Why can't the animal smile? so dumb it's so dumb like it's a dumb question first of all which it never tries to answer and like i get it you know it's supposed to be a mirror of how aaron himself can't smile but animals don't smile and animals don't laugh and it's dopey to ask why not unless you're making some kind of point about it which the song never does i mean you might as well be saying about like why can't the animals do karate it's just (laughs) nonsense can you not make them smile with your magic drum (laughs) nope just stand on two legs or maybe he's still ticked about earlier when he was trying to get them to smile and they weren't. But he's such a hypocrite about it. It sounds like it's supposed to be a riddle that he, no one answers. Yeah. And so at the beginning, Aaron sings, you never heard a lion laugh. And there's Baba the sheep with the wool around his face performing a lion's mane, <laughs> followed by you never saw a gator grin, which first <laughs> off, how do they know alligators exist? Secondly, for this one, the camel bends his knees, lowers his back, and makes a really disturbing-looking alligator face. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, they were <laughs> they, they were not alligators in ancient Israel. Okay, not even yeah, well, crocodiles. crocodiles maybe. I mean, crocodiles, in Egypt, but yeah, not gators. No, and also crocodiles and gators kind of do smile. Yeah. Kid, you're not tracking here, but <laughs> but he does the, the camel does that weird gator face before Aaron says gator grin. So I'm watching this thinking, what is that camel doing? Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> this whole song, the animals dance along and imitate other animals. Aaron mentions, but that's the weirdest one. The donkey puts on caribou antlers briefly and looks a bit like a Rankin Bass reindeer. So that was neat. Mm. And the crowd loves this, but Aaron doesn't. Because his hatred of all people starts building up within him and he shouts at the crowd, how dare you laugh and be happy after what you did, or no, after what your kind did to my family. So he wipes off his painted smile, throws down his drum and runs away with the troop along with him as the crowd chases them out of town. So we see them out in the desert again. Ben Harriman is unsurprisingly mad, but it's the calm, a little too quiet anger. It's just like, you'll pay for this indignity. Hmm. That was a little chilling. But that doesn't last long as Ali spots camped out for the night another nearby caravan. This one headed by not one, not two, but three kings. Again, all three performed by Paul Freeze. Each has a different but familiar Paul Freeze voice. It is night. We must break camp. And swiftly, the star waits not for us. Strike the tents, pack the camels. It's like he's doing a best of here. And I'm surprised they didn't start singing We Three Kings here. I don't think that song ever made it into a Rankin Bass special. They were probably saving it, hoping to make it sound special at some point. Yeah, but they never did. If there was any point to put it in, here it is, y'all. Well, it was early on, so okay, they didn't know yeah. they weren't going to get to All it. Right. They wanted to save it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good theory. And then they forgot, and then they're like, well, what can we do now? <laughs> Christmas in Killarney! They ran out of money. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we get a close-up of the star they're following as we go to commercial. Yeah, there's a nice dramatic cue there. I, I, I kind of like how the music works as we go to commercials. Yeah. Like this big, bold orchestra, and then like a few quiet, simple notes. Mr. Scrooge has been seeing more ghosts than usual this year. They are after the noose. 
can stop them. It's the five-piece holiday meal deal from Kentucky Fried Chicken with two buttermilk biscuits and that delicious new stuffing for just four ninety-nine. It's meant for two. More ghosts? We brought a ten-piece holiday meal with four buttermilk biscuits and more stuffing for just nine ninety-nine. You have money up there? Get the five or ten-piece holiday meal deal at Kentucky Fried Chicken today. I like the back half of the special a lot more. Like from this point on, when it gets to the actual like nativity story part, I think it becomes a stronger special. Oh yeah, me too. Now that they're weaving in the three Kings and they're part of the story, they really make them part of the story very, very well. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you don't need that first half. But as we come back from commercial, Greer Garson explains the troop didn't notice the star's wondrous beauty at first. The souls of Ben Harriman and Ollie were too filled with greed and Aaron's heart too overflowing with hatred. But Ben desperately makes a deal with the drummer boy. Do one more performance for the Kings without throwing another fit and you get half of what we earn and you get to go free. But the King's caravan is packing up because they're following a star. They have to travel by night. But Ben calls out to them, imploring them to stop and let them put on their show. Nope. They leave him weeping as Ollie points out what they're loading onto their camels. Why, it's gold. I wrote down golf. Oh, dear. <laughs> it's golf. <laughs> it's gold, frankincense of myrrh, of course. Uh, but one of the camels is too weak for the long journey to go on. And before Aaron can get out a word of protest beyond no, Ben Harmon agrees to sell the king's Aaron's camel, Joshua. He offers to give Aaron his share of the gold, but Aaron doesn't want it now, so they let him go. They're done with him now that they have a bag full of coins the sides of Aaron's head. And that is the last we see of Ben Haramed and Ali in this entire special. They're done. And, and that's good. We didn't need any kind of defeat the evil villains that come back at the end of the story or anything like that. I'm, I'm okay with this. Just write them out. Okay. Yeah, I think I am too. It, it, they serve their purpose in uh, kind of getting him and the wise men together, I guess. There we go. Yeah. But, you know, back to the first half of the story, like we spent way too much time with them to, uh, it, it does feel like that was a lot of time with them just to kind of have them be the, uh, the introduction between these other characters. Right. That's where I'm kind of wondering, oh, you're gone. Okay. Bye. <laughs> it's almost like this is one of those stories that doesn't necessarily really need a villain. It doesn't. But because that's how these kind of things are usually told, they felt like they had to have one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they made these characters. There we go. So Aaron is now effectively lost until his animal buddies point out the light of the star the kings were following. And he decides to do the same as we hear the Vienna Boys Choir sing One Star in the Night. This is my favorite song of the special. I it's like very it pretty. a lot. Yeah, I like it too. It is very pretty, but they talk over most of it. Uh, thankfully, <laughs> there's an isolated version I found floating around the internet, and I really like it. So I'll put okay, that in Okay, good, because I was thinking, like, I would put that into, like, a Christmas mix. Yeah, this definitely... I wish it had become more of a Christmas standard, like the songs on Rudolph, because it's really, really beautiful. Yeah, I was surprised that it hadn't. I was surprised I had not heard the song because it seems like it could be one that could stand on its own outside the special. Let's give it its day, y'all. Who sings it? Do you have that in your notes? I didn't write that down. It's the Vienna Boys Choir again. Oh, was it? Them yeah. again? Okay. Mm. Every kid's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they were a big deal in the late 60s. So they, they were. were. Like them and the Or the I think they were a bigger deal than they are now, at least. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't like, uh, you know, Burr Lives, you know, where you could throw those songs on an album and then everybody's going to be, you know, they're going to be top 10 hits. Speaking of Burl Lives, I, I, I failed to mention this earlier, um, but since you brought him up, I had wondered when I was watching this, you know, we have, um, what's her name? Gar Greer, what's her name again? Greer, Greer Garson. Greer Garson. 
yeah as the storyteller but i was wondering as i watched this now what would it have been like if someone like Burl Ives or Andy Griffith or some of these more standard <laughs> Rankin Bass narrators had narrated this? Um, and I thought it was kind of amusing to think about. I could see Andy doing it well. Yeah, I'm trying to think who I would want to see Andy Griffith. <laughs> Burl Ives would work. We all know uh, that he will narrate another caravan later in life. Yeah, the one of courage. <laughs> Just revisited that recently. Oh, did you? <laughs> That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm stuck on like, uh, yeah. Obviously, you can't have Sam the Snowman in the desert uh, narrating this. Not with that attitude. But, <laughs> <laughs> but Aaron arrives at the gates of Bethlehem, and he turns around to see what's described as a gentle army of poor shepherds, all of them being led toward the tiny town. And sure enough, it's a bunch of shepherds walking toward the town. And when we get to the stable, there are dozens of them crowded around it. Y'all, I don't remember two football teams worth of shepherds in any nativity scene I've ever seen. (laughs) That's a big crowd. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's almost like a zombie, like like they're coming out of the night (laughs) and and invading uh, Bethlehem. Like, you know, I guess I don't have like historical issues with it. Like, you know, I don't. The, the, yeah, there's the biblical text doesn't really like, specify, but uh, I mean, it does. That the city is crowded, and almost every depiction, it's usually like this very small, quiet little scene we see in nativity sets. Um, so I did making it crowded like that. That's, yeah, I guess not. It I have no qualms with it. Okay, it is it is different from the usual portrayal, though. It is. Right. Uh, yeah, we're we're used to seeing this small, kind of isolated because. It's in the stable, so it's kind of in the back. It's in the back. But big crowd there, I guess, gathering around. Well, I mean, if you're a whole bunch of shepherds on a hill and the angel comes to visit you and tells you, hey, there's something important going on over there. Yeah, you're all going to rush. So maybe it was a bigger crowd than what we're used to. Yeah, I'm trying to remember because at some point the angels or somebody tell them to go and, and spread the word about what's going right. on. Right. But you know, yeah, they go, tell them go and tell everyone. Here we yeah. Go. But I'm trying to remember like if that happens before or after they actually go to the to, The to shepherds the, in the biblical text are only mentioned once. Like the angel appears and tells them to go and it says yeah. and they did. Yeah. So, so that is satisfied. Uh I get the wise men had a small caravan, but I counted at least twenty two shepherds, not including the caravan. <laughs> I also understand there were more shepherds who went to see the baby Jesus than the one you get in your nativity scene if you're lucky. Right. Yeah. (laughs) But Aaron doesn't care about that. He spots his camel and goes running towards him along with the other animals. Mm -hmm. But that's right as a Roman charioteer speeds down the same road and hits Baba the lamb, then just takes off, leaving the scene of an accident. Baba got run over by a Roman. (laughs) Aaron hurriedly pushes his way through the crowd, trying to get to the kings for help, carrying the dying lamb in his arms because symbolism. But as he gets to the front, he sees the focal point of the crowd's attention. We don't dwell on Aaron's reaction to the scene, just that, hi, everybody, this is also happening. So he approaches one of the kings. It's the tall, dark-skinned one who's usually identified as Balthazar. Yeah, Balthazar. But this special says it's Gaspar. At any rate, it's the one with the frankincense, which I found appropriate here as he explains to Aaron there's nothing he himself can do to save his dying lamb. But but you are a king! A mortal king only, but there is a king among kings who would save your little friend. The babe? So, history time. Frankincense was an incense used as an offering to God Not a common gift for a baby shower, but that's why it's here in this story. So I thought that was appropriate that they chose this king to say this line. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Rankin Bass thought that much into it, but something I noticed. Yeah, I don't know how much I thought about it either. I um, nobody signed up for my uh, my my theology class on uh, (laughs) why the what's going on here, but um. Yeah, I have some issues with, uh, Go ahead. Uh, I guess, some of the theology and, you know, 
blonde Mary and there's just there's yeah. some things. Well, right. <laughs> I've got some notes too, Michael. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into it. I think my biggest issue is is kind of the whole attitude of I need my lamb healed, but I have no gift to bring. Like there's this kind of uh I, I don't know this this kind of transactional nature to uh, to what Aaron is going for, and I like I understand like he doesn't know, um, but the the special itself kind of seems to reinforce that that uh, you know you do something for me, I'll do something for you. Um, yeah, yeah, that was what I had too. I mean, the little drummer boy as a song and a story is obviously not biblical, but it's you know it's tacked on and it's taking place around the biblical story. And the this the message of the song has always been that it's this offering, you know, right. that it's all he has to bring. It's kind of like, you know, the woman who anoints Jesus's feet, you know, is the give or the woman who gives the two pennies, you know, or however much, but that you give this small thing, but it's all you have. And mm-hmm. that it's so offered to And when you make it, like you said, transactional, it just it kind of ruins the message of the song. Uh, making right. it um, like he's not doing it as this offering. He's doing it so that he can get his sheep saved. Right. Right. I have that same right. note too. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the song, I mean, it's a beautiful song. I love the, oh, yeah. the message of the song. It's, it's just this gift of complete humility. Like I don't have anything, but I want to give it to you because I want to give it to you because you're worthy of it. Um, not because, yeah, I don't want to beat a dead lamb, but um <laughs> Yeah, Gaspar suggests to Aaron, go and look upon the newborn king. He lays Baba down and goes up there, and we're back in the little drummer boy song to finish it. The boys' choir sings as we see Aaron march to the stable and silently mime to the baby and his mother, shall I play for you? The animation in this is really good and pretty, and I like the animation of the ox and lambs keeping time. And you yeah. see all the little lambs not in their head. <laughs> yeah, yep. they're not like I'm used to in other portrayals of this, or maybe I'm just thinking of the Animaniacs one, where they're like tapping their feet. I like that they're just nodding their heads. So this version of the song by the Vienna Boys Choir is the version I hear in my head when I think of the song The Little Drummer Boy, which I might be alone on this hill, but does either of you have a definitive version of The Little Drummer Boy? I, I do. Um, and I've been singing it in my head the past few days since I watched this. Um, it is, And I'm not singing The Little Drummer Boy part, but mine is, um, is Bing Crosby and David Bowie's yep. Little Drummer Boy <laughs> slash Peace on Earth. And so I'm singing the, Bo- the Bowie parts like... As the specials playing, I'm going peace on earth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only they'd waited. Yeah, can remember. you imagine David Bowie narrating the special? Oh man, there you go. Nice. Yeah, I'm into that. Yeah, I can't think of the name of the the. Uh, there, there's an old chorus, an old choir of of uh, people who. Um, I'll think of it as soon as I go talk in, but. Okay. Actually, I'm. Thinking, oh, the Harry Simeon Corral. Oh, uh, okay. Is, yeah, I know that one. Yeah. And didn't you? Didn't that name come up? Yeah, that when, was. When you yeah, were about the history of that, the show. That might be the first recording of this arrangement of it. Okay. Yeah, I've got an old like uh, classic Christmas songs nice. kind of uh, album with like you know with Harry Belafonte and Elvis and stuff on it. And nice. They're on it singing that song. So. Yeah, it's really good. So for me, it's this one with the Vienna Voice Choir, followed by Bing and David Bowie. And third, thanks to my parents, is a disco version by the <laughs> Sal Soul Orchestra. <laughs> nice. I, I'm not, I can't imagine that. I have to look it up. <laughs> uh, it, it works, but all, maybe it just works for me because I've heard it every Christmas for my entire life. So it's a very, it's Philly Soul. And my parents are Philadelphia natives, so of course. Okay. Well, and here's where they fit in what we were talking about earlier. Gaspar explains to Aaron, your gift of music, give it out of simple desperation of a pure love is the one favored above all. And that's all it took to revive your baby lamb. So I guess in this version, Jesus's first miracle is not the wedding at Cana. 
(laughs) (laughs) It's bringing Baba back to life. Well, (laughs) you brought up Harry Potter earlier. You know, it's like (laughs) one of those, like infantile magic before you know you're a wizard he makes the yeah. the scr- the glass in front of the snake disappear how'd that happen no one knows yeah this is non-canonical yeah. apocrypha <laughs> <laughs> a whole bunch of that and somehow this makes aaron decide he loves humans again and like I mean, his transformation here at the end doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Like I, I, I don't see how it's his decision to love his fellow humans kind of connects to the healing of his lamb. Like I can see why he would be grateful to baby Jesus, but then to suddenly, Oh, and now everybody is fine. Everybody, I love everybody now. I don't, yeah, it, it was, well, that. the way Greer Garson explains it is Aaron finally realized the hate he carried in his heart was wrong as is all hatred will ever be wrong. For more powerful, more beautiful by far than all the eons of sadness and cruelty and desolation which had come before was that one tiny crystalline second of laughter. Are they talking about the baby's laughter? Do we see baby Jesus laugh in this? No, I don't think so. I didn't think so either. I thought I missed it. I could barely see his face smiling. Yeah, or doing I don't anything. remember actually seeing him. No, he's right. got the glow around him too much, and I can't make yeah. out his face at all. But I think she's talking about the baby's laughter. I remember being a little confused about the laughter, too. Like, whether she's talking about him or did Aaron laugh as he was doing it? I don't remember that either. I think it must be referring to baby Jesus, but it just, they just rushed through this last bit of kind of character growth. It's like, Oh, we spent all that time on the villains and now we got to wrap this up. It's only a 30 (laughs) minute special. Yeah. Right. Uh, Okay. Baby Jesus laughed and Aaron is better now. Sure. (laughs) We don't need to see his face. Uh, I guess you could chalk it up to throughout the gospels. People encounter Jesus and they're changed by it. So Aaron right. was as well. <laughs> I think that's, I think that is the message. I think that's what they're trying to get across. There we Just, go. Uh, we'll count it. All I remember about my kids as newborn hours, old babies is the only time they looked like they were laughing is when they were gassing. <laughs> so right. exactly. Cause ch- children aren't able to smile at that age. <laughs> no <laughs> babies just fart. Why can't the baby smile? <laughs> It's a developmental milestone that comes later. It's called the social smile. I don't remember exactly when it comes out. This is what my degree is in from college, child and family development. Okay. Well, we just put that into a song and then we'll. uh... (laughs) Music moved baby Jesus. Yeah, that that's how we go out. Any final thoughts on the little drummer boy? Well, I would just say this is not related to the little drummer boy, the special, but more of the little drummer boy, uh, just as a song. Okay. um, so when I was a kid and we would always have the church Christmas pageants, mm-hmm. um, my mom was always the director of it. And so I usually got to pick my part because um, we didn't have a lot of the kids, kids in the church to begin with. But there was one year when I was probably in kindergarten or first grade that I just insisted, I want to be the little drummer boy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and my mom kept trying to tell me, well, you know, he's not in the Bible. He's not in the Christmas pageant, but I insisted. So we had a part. <laughs> Um, you know, they do the whole main part of the pageant. Baby Jesus is born. You know, the other kids that are playing the parts are up there. They got the baby in the manger and everything stops. They play, they play that song. And here I am with a coffee tin made into a drum. Oh, and it marched down the, the center aisle of the church. <laughs> And that's it. And then they go back and wrap up the rest of the play. <laughs> that is a super sweet story. That yeah, is especially a sweet love, story. Like, they actually like work the song in for you because yeah, they, the uh, wow. that's awesome. And then the next year I wanted to be King Herod. <laughs> <laughs> what a jump. And I was perfect. <laughs> you have a ton of range, Brandon. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I was King Herod one year. That was one where it's like, we were only reading it. We didn't dress up or anything. It was just, Here's a line of kids reading the story. (laughs) Well, thank you both again. This was a fun one. Always glad to have you guys on. Thank you, man. Yeah, this is it was fun to talk about. This It's not my favorite Rankin Best Christmas special, um, but one that I still manage to watch, you know, not every year, every other year. Um, Just it's it's it is a classic just because it was on so much when I was a kid um, that uh, I appreciate being able to talk about it. 
Yeah, I'm all. It's always fun to come on the show with you, Mike and Michael. Um, I can't remember if we've done this together or not before. I don't think but, so. Um, we've interacted before online, and yeah. so it was nice to talk with you as well. You um, I I was glad when you asked me to do this too, and getting ready for it this week because um, you know to to blow Mike's secret, you know it's not exactly Christmas time right now, uh, <laughs> but I have just been saying recently. I'm ready for Christmas time. Like I need a little Christmas right this very minute. <laughs> there we go. And so to like watch a special, especially one that um, if I had seen before, I was not very familiar with it, but I pretty sure this might've been my first time watching it. Um, it did, it, it did, it did the heart good this week. Well, all right. Yes. Well, if people want to smash your pottery and insist they were only trying to juggle for you, where can they find you on the internet, Brandon? Um, on Twitter at brand med and on Instagram at blessed are the geek. And sometimes we have a podcast that comes out called star weirdos about star Wars. And Michael, uh, Twitter. I'm Michael may comics with an X. Um, and Michael may online is my website that kind of collects all the, the various podcasts that I do. I'm actually I'm trying you guys. I'm trying to like narrow them down. I like getting, <laughs> I've got so many, but, uh, I'm working on that. And, um, uh, but you can, you can find them on Michael may online. And if you want to read the show notes, you can find them at adventcalendar.house. There you can find links to Twitter and Instagram. You can say hi to me over there. I'll see you all in a couple days for now for Michael May and Brandon Medley from the worst traveling circus in history. (laughs) This is Mike Westfall saying careful of the icy patch and also that carpet that someone just rolled out. (laughs) Good night. And now these messages. What's your favorite guilty pleasure? Is it watching cheesy Christmas romances, no matter what time of year it is? For Holly Cuomo and Scarlett Alexandra, this is it. These two host the Netflixmas podcast, where they talk about the best, the worst, and the cringiest Christmas romances from all your favorite streaming services. You can listen today on Spotify, iTunes, and Podbean. And don't forget to check out their Patreon for bonus episodes. Have a very merry Netflixmas and a sappy new year. Hi, this is Manny from Feliz Christmas, Merry Navidad, the bilingual, multilingual Christmas podcast. In our podcast, you will hear about foods, traditions, how this 2020 Christmas will be interesting, especially from six feet away, and many more new surprises. Join me on the road to Christmas, along with many guest hosts from other podcasts from the Christmas Podcast Network. You can listen to us on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Radio Public, or just search for us on your favorite podcast platform. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at FCMN Podcast. Or visit our website, FCMNPodcast.com. Feliz Christmas, Merry Navidad. Next time on the Advent Calendar House. <laughs>